All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth concurrent session of the day, Turning the Baggage into Luggage. Um, our presenter today is Nick Britton of Lake Michigan College. Um, Nick Britton is an English instructor and serves as the Chair of Communication and Foreign Language Departments at, the, at, at Lake Michigan College. He has overseen the development of hybrid courses using Zoom and created several literature courses that utilize emerging technologies. He finds these tech-based methods work well with his approach to literature um, that emphasizes context and other post-constructionalist ideas. Um, in addition, he is currently working on the new virtual reality lab at Lake Michigan College's Niles campus, which will enable several exciting possibilities for students and instructors. Now, if you have any questions at all during the presentation today, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we'll be able to address those at the end of the talk. Now, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our presenter. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. So uh, kind of a, a funny story. Um, as educators, I think that we, we all are sort of used to the idea that there's like a trickster God out there, leprechaun or someone who's kind of messing with us. And, and whoever that is got me today a little bit um, because I had the opportunity to present and I, I love presenting with Hawks and this innovative educator um, uh, conference. And then I got, uh, and they said, well, three o'clock on Thursday, perfect time for me. And that's great. And then I got a, um, and so it's about technology and how we can we can learn some, take some of the lessons we learned from 2020 and into 2021 now and take it forward into uh, how can we keep some of this stuff, uh, go turn the baggage into luggage. And then I said, well, then that's, you know, my school's a clinic for the, for the vaccine, for the COVID vaccine. And they said, yeah, we can get you on the wait list Thursday at three. Um, and so I don't know if, would it be Thoth or something like that maybe is in charge of education? And I think he's messing with me today. So um, I told the vaccine people, if there's an, I'm on the wait list. I said, if there's an extra one, just come in, I'll be presenting. Just jab me in the arm and let's do it. Um, I thought that'd be a great way uh, to make sure everybody's awake and paying attention at that point. Uh, they weren't comfortable with that. Um, but uh, so they said I can finish up and then they'll give me my shot. But um, I uh, think I might use that in class sometime, just have like a go to the doctor's office and have um, get a shot or something right at the beginning of the lecture and watch students just like wake right up like I bet you're taking notes now. So anywho, so that's why I have a mask on my face in case somebody comes in and says, hey, guess what? So but anyways, so a funny story there. I don't know if that fell flat or not because I can't hear anybody. But so uh, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I think I'm going to share the whole screen here. And then so what we're talking about today is, you know, obviously we have a lot of baggage uh, coming out of this past year, right? We, it's not been um, the most fun. I mean, it was scary when it first started, right? And then we sort of kind of got used to it. And, um, and, and it just seems like education has sort of packed a lot of baggage now. Well, we're, we're going to, it's looking like we're going to open back up in the future and hey, maybe we're going to get through this. And so now what are we going to do? How do we take this stuff that we drudge through and how are we going to use it uh, to be useful going forward? So where are we going? Well, um, at least in Michigan, where I'm at, we're expecting to be basically, our high schools are basically already open for the most part, um, but our colleges are expecting to be face-to-face -face again. And, um, but we say that with a grain of salt, right? I mean, education's probably never going to be just face-to-face -face ever again, right? I mean, it, there's always, there's, the world's changed now. And so um, remote learning and the new technologies, they're just gonna be a part of it. And so when we have these words like hybrid, you know, we have different categories, different things we call this stuff. And, and so we have this word hybrid, well, what makes a hybrid course? How much technology do we need in it to make it hybrid? And I know that our school, we've been debating this for, for all year. You know, so what, what, are we, what, what is it 20? They used to throw things, well, if it's 50% or more, it's, it's online. Well, how do I quantify how much technology I'm using? You know, like I, I can't really tell you 50%. So, well, if we meet X number of times, what if I email you 20 times and we meet once, what's the ratio? I don't know. So we're going to basically be all hybridized from this point. And so to accommodate this new world, um, we're going to have to develop these new flexible learning environments. Um, that maintain the best of face-to-face -face education, because I know I'm definitely looking forward uh, to getting back in the classroom, which puts me in a weird position at my school because I was always the guy saying, hey, let's bring in Zoom, let's bring in virtual reality, and let's do these new technologies. And I'm the guy who's saying, I'm just too antsy. I got to get back in the classroom. I've got to be in front of students. So it's kind of a weird experience for me, but we're going to try to go back in the classroom, but we're going to bring some of this tech with us. Okay, we're going to turn that baggage into luggage. So why are we going to, why are we going on this trip? Um, so why, why do we need to worry about why can't we just go back to the way it used to be? 
Um, well, we can't because COVID and our responses to it, COVID-19, uh, it did more than just kill hundreds of thousands of people. That's bad enough, but it did more than that. Um, it also devastated our schools or maybe our responses to it. Um, and so we have students now who um, were doing really well before all this happened, and now they're not. I mean, now they're failing. Uh, now we have students who were not doing so well. Maybe they were faking it, um, getting through as best they could, and this, boom, it pulled the wool over their eyes or it, it pulled their disguise down. Um, so our schools are really in trouble, um, and our whole education system is just sort of having this existential crisis right now. Students are failing at shocking rates. Um, and hopefully this opens up. I think I shared the screen properly, but if we open this up, we'll see that um, uh, inside higher ed, I'm going to hope this share our shirt for you guys. Um, it's uh, talking about, and you, you see articles like this all the time, I'm sure, um, that um, uh, there's just so many Fs going on. So many students are failing classes right now. I mean, it, it's tragically high. Um, I got a chat here. Um, Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Um, so um, sharing properly. So, um, and we could go through this. You can find numerous articles, but you know, we're talking some schools, 50, 79%, 42%, massive, massive failure rates. I only, I haven't done an actual study on myself, but just anecdotally, yeah, grades are down, you know, for sure. Um, and that's, what are we going to do? You know, so this is permanent record type stuff. Um, so do we just stop giving grades? Uh, you know, that's something that's been proposed. USA Today just wrote an article about that in uh, in December. Um, that to heck with it. Let's just stop uh, giving grades at all. What's the point if it's not going to work? And I could. Um, that looks like some ads are loading. Oh, here we go. Um, and so, do we stop with the standardized tests? Do we? Um, do we? How do we do this? And if if we revamp the entire system now and it's just for one year, do we? How do we go back? You know, how do we go back to what we had before? Like, what's it, what's it going to look like? And so we do need to figure out how are we going to, it's not like we can say 2020 didn't happen. You know, in the beginning of 2021, that didn't happen. No, it, it did. And so we have to incorporate this somehow that um, these things are still here. We're not going to stop giving grades. We're not, it, it turns out as much as I would have loved to see standardized test scores go away, it turns out they didn't, you know, they're still here with us. Um, and so my son just took the SAT just the other day. Um, he's in one of those programs where they have, they make junior high kids subject themselves to that too. Um, but it's, it is what it is. Um, so what can we do? You know, as educators, we don't have a lot of control over it. You know, we can't dictate school policy, much less national policy. You know, we can't say that, okay, this is how it's going to be. You know, nobody, the, the, the president didn't ask me um, what we should do. The Department of Education never said, hey, Britain, what do you think? You're a smart guy. What do you think we should do? Because um, I would have, I got ideas. If he wants to contact me, I've got some ideas. Um, but nobody called. Um, so we can't predict what criteria are going to be used to measure student success. You know, we don't know what does the Department of Education want from us. Uh, if you're on the K-12 level, if you're on the collegiate level, um, our colleagues, right? We we work with our, our partner schools. Um, we sort of sort of settle on certain things that are um, the criteria we're going to use. But we can adjust our, our modes, right? Our modalities, the way we the way we approach teaching. That's something we can control. And so. Um, so while remote learning, which I think people are getting kind of like, it's getting kind of a bad reputation right now, a bad rep right now, um, it's got its limitations, but it's not like face-to-face -face was always a raging success either. Um, you know, education was, I was talking with a, a relative of mine actually, and she said, well, yeah, school's bad now, the education system's taking a hit, but that's really only because it was so vulnerable to begin with. And she's got a point. I don't know that I want to go back to how things used to be. I'm looking forward to getting back in the classroom, but I don't really want to go back to say 2019 or 2017 or when I've been teaching since, gosh, I think I started teaching in 2011, 2010, something like that. Um, so I don't wanna go back to that. Uh, can we make a better world? So let's pack up our bags, um, see what we've learned, see what we can do, and can we put forward something that's better um, than what came obviously in the last year, but even in our past careers, like what can we do? What can, how can we make 2021, 2022 better um, than where we've been? Because I think we, you know, this, there's that uh, adage in uh, investing, right, where chaos breeds opportunity. And boy, we got chaos now. And so if chaos breeds opportunity, then we've got us um, some, uh, uh, we've got some opportunities. So, so how are we going to get there? Um, first off, just the basic thing. Don't worry, this will get more exciting in a second. We got to talk about hardware. Okay, because some people, they're, they're afraid of it, right? Because you see these gamers on YouTube and TV, you talk to the teenagers and they talk about how um, there's this um, thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And I was even at a meeting a couple years ago and I said, well, we're going to build this $80,000 lab. So this is before anybody had heard of COVID-19. They said, we're going to build this $80,000 lab and that way we can teach online. And I said, we don't have 80,000. What are you going to do with it? Give, give me a thousand tops and you can pocket the 79,000, do whatever you want with it. We don't need that much money. I mean, you don't even need a thousand. 
all you really need is pretty basic. Um, you know, what you're doing now is basically all you need. Some of you already know this, but just in case, maybe this is new to you, just your basic PC, Mac, Chromebook, um, laptop, whatever it is you got, um, whatever you're using now will probably work. And then I like to have a headset. Um, I think that just sort of blocks out the sound around me. It gives me that microphone. Um, I sometimes have the microphone too close to my face. You can spend as much as you want on them. If you want to become a professional gamer, you can spend hundreds of dollars on them. If you just want to teach a class, like $30 will do the trick. And that's really about it for hardware. Sometimes it's nice um, to have a cell phone. I wonder if my phone will show up here. Um, have a phone uh, that has a good uh, data connect, uh, connection. This came up just the other day. My home Wi-Fi, for some reason, just decided to go out about five minutes before class started. Because it just, you know, the gods were messing with me again and said, hey, let's, let's keep poking Nick here. We'll mess with this guy. And uh, so what I did was I just flipped over my phone. I um, uh, hot spotted it, connected my laptop to it and was back in class. I could demo how to do that. If you don't, if you said, what did he just say? If you have a cell phone, you can probably hotspot it and you can connect your computer to it. Um, I'm not going to go over how to do it, but just go to um, YouTube, type in how to hotspot my phone and you'll probably get like a thousand videos or ask any teenager on the planet. They can probably, it's literally a couple buttons. So you got to push. So if you have a cell phone, that'll help. That'll give you that backup on um, that backup uh, in case your Wi-Fi does go out and it probably will on occasion. That's just how life is. So what's our first stop? I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm moving fast here. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to slow down here. So we got to talk about learning management systems. And some people are, um, quick to adopt these. Some schools have access to them. Um, personally at LMC, we use Canvas. Um, now, I don't know the business end of that too much from what I understand. Canvas is a pretty pricey uh, learning management system. Um, other schools use Blackboard. Uh, some schools develop their own. Um, a lot of the K-12s are using uh, Google Classroom or something like that, um, which is basically free. Um, you know, there's, it's a very low cost. Um, even if your school doesn't have one, and not, not every school is going to, it's just maybe it's not in the budget, maybe it's not something, I would assume that they see the importance of it now, but let's just say you're stuck and they don't. Um, Google Classroom is probably a pretty good one. Um, you're gonna need a way to communicate with students when they aren't in class. And the learning management system really facilitates that. That's something that's gonna give, so even if you're just, eh, I'm not too keen on Canvas yet or Blackboard or whatever it is, this is a really good way to put messages out there because students are, and when I say not in class, obviously there's, they're not physically in class, right? That's that has, sometimes students are simply absent. But then there's the you're in class, but you're not really in class uh, kind of student who is attending. And I've certainly done that. We've all done it, right? We've been in enough Zoom meetings by this point that we sometimes are there, but then, oh, that guy's gonna talk. I'm gonna Zoom out for a little while. I'm gonna go think about something else. Well, if you have a learning management system, you can communicate with people who even maybe they showed up and weren't paying attention. I literally had a student the other day say, I said, okay, go do this task and we're on Zoom. And she said, uh, what are we supposed to be doing? And I said, um, well, we're doing this task and it's on Canvas, it's on it's in the discussions. And she said, oh, cause I was listening, but I, I wasn't really listening. I was just sort of kind of listening. And I said, well, I appreciate the honesty. Um, that probably describes more than just you. There's 20 of you in here that probably describes like 10 of you. Luckily, I don't have to repeat myself. It's in discussions. So go go check that out. Another thing too is that schools are gonna be moving away from that encouraging perfect attendance. I, mean, I know on the collegiate level, we didn't do that too much, but that was a big deal, right? In the K through 12. And so I think that culture comes with students where they're used to trying to go to school every day, especially those like those straight A, those like, you know, really good students. And they're trying to go to class every single day. They wanna to go to all of them. And cause that's what, what K through 12 taught them to do. Well, I don't think we're gonna do that anymore. Um, I think that from going forward, I don't know, schools are gonna handle this differently, but I'm willing to bet there's not gonna be that perfect attendance certificate for 13 years before the student gets to the college level. Um, and so they're gonna say, look, I'm showing symptoms of something. you know." And I know that's one thing about 2020 was I didn't get sick very often. As educators, we're in the classroom a lot. I know I always, I would get my flu shot, I would take care of myself, sanitizer, everything. I still got pretty darn sick at least twice a year, about two weeks after the semester started, every semester. That didn't happen this year. I like that. Um, that's something I wanna keep, now I don't have a presentation about that, but let's go ahead and keep that one. So I'm gonna tell my students, if you're sick, you got even just a cough or some stuff going on, Go ahead and stay home. You don't have to come to class. Check Canvas. Um, we'll get, I'll get you caught back up. I'd rather you miss a day. You miss one day, maybe two, than have me miss two days, or because then everybody's kind of out of being in my presence, or make the whole class sick or the whole school sick. Even before, I don't know if this happened around the country, but even in, uh, before COVID hit, last in 2019, the fall of 2019, um, flu hit pretty early in Michigan, as it tends to do, because we're a really 
cold, wet state where people tend to huddle up indoors uh, pretty early on, and we passed diseases around pretty fast. And um, schools were already uh, shutting down for a couple of days just for flu before we'd even heard of COVID, before anybody had done this before. And so, um, so I think that's gonna, that might be something that sticks around. And so you're going to want to have that communication system uh, to be able to let students know what's going on. Um, so yeah, I think that we might go remote um, for flu outbreaks. You know, I don't, I don't anticipate a flu coming along that's going to be as bad as COVID was, but we don't know. I mean, something, flus have certainly been bad before, and there could be others, not like COVID-19 is the only COVID virus out there. Um, and even say, if we say, look, if we shut down for two weeks in February or something, do we save 10,000 lives? Maybe it's, that could be something that could be something that happens. So, um, so just as some examples, um, like I say, these are probably the, the two I'm most familiar with. Um, I use uh, Canvas as a professional and my kids use, um, well, my, my son who's still in, uh, in high school, he's in junior high now, um, he uses uh, Google Classroom. Um, you can put announcements on there. Um, and so sometimes even if you had a face-to-face -face class, okay, so you had class today and everything was normal, you could still type up a basic synopsis of what happened in class or what you're gonna do that day and put in announcements. And that way when those students just say, hi, I wasn't here today, but like, did we do anything? Did we do anything important? And you just want to like, yeah, yeah, we did do the importance. No, I just, I, I, went, I was one, one of these days, I'm going to write back to a student and say, nope, we didn't do anything. Today was one of those blow off wasted days. We didn't do a darn thing. We saw you weren't here. We decided to heck with it. The class isn't worth having. No, of course we did something important. You just put in a, a synopsis up here on announcements and just say, look, this is what we covered. Um, check this, check this. And then even the student who is diligent, you know, and trying and staying focused. I know that for me, especially, I'm an English guy. But I know, especially for me in math class, uh, when I was having to take math still, it would make perfect sense in the classroom. I would say, man, the teacher put up on the board and I get it. That's how you do that equation or quadratic stuff, whatever it is you're doing. You, it makes a lot of sense. And I would go home and I would be so focused. I'm going to do this right. And I would have no idea what it was. And if I'd had, now this is long before learning management systems. Nobody had ever heard of that before. If I'd had something to look at, maybe some sort of nice, and I'd, I'd taken notes in class, but they just looked like gibberish to me. If I'd had some sort of thing that the teacher had put up that I could access really quickly, I guarantee I would have, well, I can't guarantee because it was still math and it's still me, but I, I would have had a better shot. It would have been a nice tool to have. Um, so um, yeah, so it could be a nice way to just put some notes up. So even students who were there, but maybe can't remember, they got a lot going on. Um, and of course, it's a nice way to keep your lessons, schedules, assignments all organized. Okay, because I know that for me, um, and if, if anybody here who teaches the humanities, we want in our heart of hearts to be organized, right? I mean, that's a goal. But if you tell us, hey, you have the conch, you're on the, on the island, you can say whatever you want and do whatever you want, that's probably what we're going to do, right? We're going to wander. Um, our brains don't like to stay on track. We tend to go over here and then, oh, there's something shiny, we go over there. So that canvas actually, well, that's what I use, works for me too. I can say, look, I gotta get, I gotta stay focused today. Um, this is what we're working on. I, before I can teach you paragraph development, I have to teach you research or whatever. Um, and so I can kind of keep my own thoughts straight. It's a way for us to sort of stay on task because if I'm not on task, I'm who knows where I'm at. Um, so people always ask me, how do you do your whole schedule before the semester starts? Because it's better than the alternative. If I don't do it before the semester starts, who knows what we're gonna be talking about by, by week two. And so um, if possible, keep using these learning management systems, um, whatever it is, because like I say, face-to-face -face versus remote, what's the difference really going to be? Um, even a class, say we never shut down again, we never go remote ever again, we're, this tech is still there. It's something that people are still going to be having. We're basically all hybrid teachers now. I mean, that's what we do. Um, the, the world has become that. I mean, you think about uh, people often point to the printing press as like the end of the Middle Ages. This is way bigger than that ever was. I mean, this, I mean, the printing press obviously became a big deal, but that the effect of the printing press took like 100, 200 years to really, maybe 300 years to really be felt. This happened like in a few months. I mean, this is like way faster. This is a harder punch, I think, than, than maybe has ever happened in the communication um, of uh, humans ever. You know, it's pretty, pretty. Imagine, I told my students this, humans were walking around doing like human type stuff for let's just say 100,000 years. I know it's probably longer than that. But let's just say it's 100,000. We've only been writing for like 6,000 years of that. Most people couldn't do that. And now the internet's only been for like 20-ish, 25 years of that. Imagine that tiny speck of a percent of how long humans have been doing this type of communication. Picture life without it. I mean, you pretty much can't anymore. This is what humans do. Um, we, we halfway live online now. Love it or leave it, I mean, we, this is how life is. Um, so just uh, also the discussion feature. 
um, uh, what I do is I'll sometimes say, not only will I put up what happened on a learning management system, like an announcement, uh, one of the assignments I like to have is tell the students, you have to type in discussions, I'll make a discussion, say reply to this, what did we learn today? What did you learn today? And the student can put up, they have to respond and put some sort of, um, today I learned this, um, whatever it is. And then if a student does miss, um, they can, you can say, look, go look at the discussion. This is what the class talked about. Um, some students are obviously gonna do awesome with that and some students are gonna kind of not do awesome with that, um, but that's okay. It's still, and even the student writing it down, you know, that whole meta knowledge, right? That do we know what we know? We often know more than we realize in some regards and often less than we realize we know. Um, and so it might be nice to put it into a few sentences. So put up a discussion. What did you learn today? Have the students type it in. This works face-to-face, -face, this works um, at remote, however you wanna do it, it's still there. Um, so, um, when you think about it, society was already pretty much communicating through the screens, right? Um, that's kind of how we, we were becoming a screen-based society. Um, and so I think we can assume that we're not going to stop, that we talk, well, we're going to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. So that just means we're going to bump into each other while playing with our phones. Um, that's what's going to be uh, really funny about this is, sure, we're going face-to-face, -face, but it's not like we're going to look at each other's faces or anything. Um, we're still going to be using our screens and our phones and um, stuff like that. So we might as well embrace it. You know, if, if the kid's going to be looking at the, the student, we act like we don't do this. If we as humans are all going to be staring at our computers and our phones anyways, let's use that skill. It's something that we have. It doesn't have to be a distraction. And one thing that's nice about these discussions is even face-to-face, -face, this is one thing I noticed last March when we switched, Michigan switched to a remote in March of uh, 2020. Um, I had students who would not talk in class. I had rarely heard their voice. After I called attendance, they barely spoke. And if I called on them and said, well, I'll just get the ball rolling. Sometimes you could tell it they weren't happy about it. They didn't want to come out of their shell. It wasn't the right environment for them. And so they just sort of sat there and they were scared. They didn't want to talk. Imagine how prevalent that's going to be, okay, a year from now, or as I say, a few months from now, next semester. Students are not going to be great at talking in public, probably. This is not going to be a comfortable world for them. But you can play. I noticed these students who were shy back in February of 2020, March of uh, 2020, it turns out they were really great writers. They liked uh, going on the discussion boards and they suddenly came out of their shells. Now I wanna have students to where they can talk and feel comfortable with each other, but I'm not a communication prof, I'm not a speech prof, I'm not their psychologist, whatever it is that's, that's holding them back, I'm not really equipped to deal with that. But I can put it on discussion so at least they have a way to communicate. And so, and especially because people know if it's being read by everybody, they're gonna do a good job, right? And so maybe they're afraid to raise their hand, but they're not afraid to type. And so some students, it went the other way, but those shy students who didn't want to talk in public, they do like these discussions, um, and maybe, maybe, not all of them. Um, and so and you, know, you have to sort of urge the other students too, who maybe aren't as comfortable with discussions, but if we're face-to-face, -face, they can talk in class, the quiet kids can do the discussion. Um, and so it lets everybody sort of have that, that even playing field. So what's next on our itinerary? Um, so new assignments, okay, we're no longer limited um, to that old world style of just handing out papers, collecting them, grading them, and turning them back. We don't have to do that anymore. And in my domain, in, in a, uh, composition, this is a kind of a new world for us because we always have students write academic essays. And I hate the question, when am I ever going to need to know this? Because uh, um, when do you need to know APA style? It, to be honest, it doesn't come up a whole lot, does it? Um, I very rarely put stuff in AP style. Now, research skills, critical reading, critical thinking comes up all the time. We can always use that. So how, what are some other ways I can teach that? So we've been forced to come up with some new and kind of creative ways um, to uh, collaborate with each other, uh, new types of assignments, because maybe we can't like look over a student's shoulder and help them out with that essay anymore. So we come up with new ways, new things. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. Um, I'll point out to some of the sources, because I didn't, I just wasn't born knowing this. So I'll point out to some of the sources where I learned this stuff. Um, so some assignments, uh, pen and paper is great, um, but now we can do some different types of publishing Okay, unquote. Um, so I'll just click on this. It's a YouTube video where the guy will show this more detail um, than what I have time for today. Um, I think I still have it muted, but this just shows you he should get a lot of credit because um, he he's um, uh, puts together this nice 26 minute long video. Um, and it shows you how to do some of these things I'm about to go into uh, some detail over. So I'll, I'll make sure make sure this is available for you. Um, really, really nice presentation. Um, some stuff I've done. So take a pick your own path. So I'm teaching a human humanities course. And in that we're, we're exploring story and media. And so I want to have like discursive d discursive relationships and how discourse works. And it's kind of some complicated thinking, right? It's not your usual write an essay about this kind of class. And so one thing we can do is like I created this one. It's a pick your own path story. And you just use Google Slides. 
And so this is a whole new presentation. Um, it'll take just a second to load up. Um, and so um, just a sec. There's a lot of people on campus today all on the Wi-Fi, I'm thinking. Okay, um, and so, uh, and the course is about different discourses. So we're gonna have like, um, obviously race and gender and ethnic identity and so on. Well, I wanna do one with socioeconomics, okay? And so I'll just sort of go through basically the gist of this. So you click on it and it gives you this background, okay? And so in this story, you're a Caucasian hetero male, uh, a freshman, you're starting college. And so just give you remember these choose your own adventure stories since that's copyrighted, I went with pick your own path. And so you click the button and so it turns out, I'll take you just to a few slides and you gotta go get financial aid because the person's low income, okay, in this story. And uh, they've only got so much time to get to the bookstore, the car won't start. So you have to decide, do you text a friend to see if he'll give you a ride or do you try to figure it out? And whichever one I click, it'll take me to a different part of the story. And so he doesn't wanna help. He's being kind of weird about it. So, um, so do you push it or do you just say, you know, you remember this next time he needs something. And so I just say, um, you need to get your books. Do you walk to the park store? Do you get your bike ready? And so on and so forth. And so you can go through this story. And eventually you get to the, the car park store. This is kind of loosely based on a true story. Um, I grew up pretty low socioeconomic status and um, uh, didn't know much about cars. And so cars would break down and I'd have to figure it out. Um, and so you get to the car park store and the guy is being kind of condescending because you know, young males, the stereotype young males should know um, about cars and I didn't. And so I would sometimes feel kind of awkward in that place. I could tell that story, but if I tell it to students, it's just like, oh, here we go again, another old timer talking about the old days. If I put it in a, in a choose your own adventure story like that, well, it starts to maybe make more sense. And so I connect this to James Paul G's uh, writings about discourse. And so I hope that maybe that, that uh, flu makes it a little more fluid to them. They can make them too. You can have it as a learning tool or you can have it as an assignment um, where the students have to make their own. Um, another one, so some students, maybe that, I don't want to do the creative thing. I, I don't want to be quite that creative with it. You could do electronic textbooks. And this one I don't have quite as developed. Um, it's not quite as pretty yet. Um, I'll just sort of uh, demonstrate how easy it is to do. Um, but um, with this one, uh, my other area of expertise, well, I would say of expertise, but interest is um, uh, witch hunts in history. Um, and so talk about discourse there. So uh, we'll get started. And it says, um, what was life like in Salem? And so they can make like a textbook. Um, and so we often picture the Puritans as Thanksgiving decorations, but was this really the case? And so we can click on it. And then it says, um, uh, you know, think of them as the 17th century Christian version of ISIS, right? They were pretty, pretty rough people. This was not a world you want to live in. Um, and then uh, you would read this and then here in this button, it would take you back. If I had built that button in, it would take you back to, um, to this original page, um, which I can get to here. And then here's, of course, uh, James Paul G himself. Um, I could have his... Um, it's all covered up by the um, stuff, but, but so on and so forth. So you can have like different chapters in a way, in these different textbooks. I find my experience that students like this sort of stuff, um, that it's, you wanna have essays too, essays are great. We wanna do that deep dive, those, those longer writing pieces, but these other types of things are gonna access different um, parts of their brain. Um, and it's not gonna carry that same weight, that same baggage um, that uh, the essay, oh, I gotta write another essay. Have them do some of that and then have them do some writing statements and have them do something like this. Um, and this is sort of thing where um, you can actually, just to go back to this, you can share, the students can share it with each other um, and uh, collaborate. Even if they can't get together, they can collaborate and do this stuff um, just like they would like say a Google Doc or if you guys use Microsoft Teams or something like that, they can do that in real time. Um, they can be Zooming and working on the same document together. And I don't have an example of this, but videos. Um, a modern cell phone is basically a recording studio. I mean, you can do a ton of stuff with those things. Students can set those up. They, they're good with the, the technology. When you think about Instagram, um, basically makes everybody a film producer. Well, rather than just using it to show that, hey, I bought another pumpkin spice latte. Again, I bought another one. They could use that same technology, those same skills. They are essentially, when you think about what they're doing, they're setting up lighting. They're learning about audience. Um, they're learning about, um, in their own ways, pathos, ethos, logos. They're doing all that stuff. They don't realize it. You can really make it boring for them if you tell them that's what they're doing. But tell them, hey, when you do the Instagram, when you do the things that you do for that or for Twitter or something like that, you're being literacy experts. Take those same technologies and apply it to a more academic endeavor. They're probably way better at it than they realize. And of course, Zoom. Um, we're probably, Zoom is here to stay. Um, we're going to keep using it. Um, not only can you teleconference with it, but you can also use it to record lectures. Right. And I think this is really key. This is something that I was already doing before um, the COVID pandemic hit. Um, I'm going to certainly be doing it a lot more. Um, you just to do it, it's pretty easy to start a meeting. Some of you guys probably have done this before. You just start a meeting. I don't invite anyone. 
and then uh, share your screen. You're not sharing it to anyone. You're just sharing it to Zoom, basically. Push the record button and you're making a movie and you can just record your lecture right there. What I like to do is use that for things like, um, so I can teach composition. So I'll use that for like APA format, something like that, which frankly, I teach really early in the morning. So eight in the morning, you don't want to hear me talk about APA format at eight in the morning. Um, I don't want to, I'll put myself to sleep talking about that at eight in the morning. So if I were to put that slide up there, hey, we're, today we're going to learn about insect citation. The students are going to say, no, I don't want that. Um, that's the worst. So, so what I do is I make a, a short video, say 10 minutes. Um, something like that, eight minutes. You don't have a lot of time with this, so keep it quick. And then just put it on Canvas and, or, or Google Meets or whatever, email it to them, whatever you got to do. Put it on YouTube, there's a private link. And um, then if they can't remember, because who remembers all that stuff? Even I can't remember all the rules. And if they need it, it's a nice reference so they can watch it. Um, think about, um, if you ever look at like Khan Academy, what Khan Academy has done for math. Um, there's not a lot of stuff for the English world on there for composition. There's there's a little bit of history and that sort of thing. But think about some of these nuts and bolts concepts that we have, um, how to format an essay, how to um, do a works cited page, these sorts of things um, that you can teach in a few minutes, but you don't necessarily want to take up a bunch of class time. Some students get it right now. Some students need to see it 10 or 12 times. That's OK. Um, it, even with uh, I learned this by um, one of the, the big things for me was sort of looking what MIT was doing with recorded lectures, but then also when my kids were needing help with algebra and geometry, again, not a math guy. And so I would tell them they'd show up at their homework and I'd say, okay, sure, I remember that. I'll be right with you. And I'd go sneak off and watch some Khan Academy videos and figure out how to do it and then come back. Um, well, we can do the same thing with, with in English or anything, history, foreign language. My, I'm chair of the foreign language department. They do this all the time, how to conjugate um, this irregular verb, make a quick video about that, put it up on uh, learning management systems, and then the student can go back and check out that lecture. They don't have to memorize everything. They don't have to count on taking quick notes. That video sort of serves that purpose for them. And so you can keep using that in face-to-face -face classes. Um, all the time. That way students don't have to sit there and wonder, hey, what did he talk about today or what did she talk about today? They can just watch the quick video about it and also watch it at home and that allows for class time discussion. Say, hey, watch this video before class. That's your homework. It's a 10 minute long video. Watch it and then you come to class. You can start doing it in the classroom. It's a neat way to flip it and just save it to your computer and then distribute it however, uh, whatever means you have for that. And I think just to sort of wrap things up, the, um, you know, traveling with students, um, we got to keep in mind we're not the only ones uh, on this trip, right? The students were along for the ride as well. And so it's been really hard on them. Um, and so sometimes I got to remind myself, I'll get frustrated with work or I'll, I'll say, this isn't working. I can't get back to the classroom. And I realize, look, I'm being paid to do it, right? You know, I'm a professional. I've been doing this for a while. Um, I have that extra incentive. And these students, they're not, you know, that they're sort of just have these same expectations of them that they had before. They saw older brothers and sisters and cousins or whatever you, um, who were successful in school, but it was different. And now these kids are sort of struggling with how am I supposed to get these scores? How am I supposed to go to class every day when I have an impossible catalog of distractions just calling my name instead, um, right? That you tell the kid to get on the computer and then say, but don't do anything else. Just pay attention to me. Just listen to my sound of my voice and learn about APA format. The kid knows he can open up that tab or he she can open up that tab and go do something else. Um, and so think of all the times you've been distracted in meetings. Now imagine being 17 or 19 um, and how much worse it must have been. And then, okay, we're going to say, okay, we're back. We're back in the classroom. These are kids who we've already seen a mental health crisis. We've been talking about that uh, today um, at Hawks or the earlier present presenter, the keynote almost about this. And now we're going to thrust all these kids back into a room together and say, okay, go learn. Everything's we're, we're normal again. That's going to be really tough. They're going to want to have some of these, these computers might be their safety net a little bit. It might be a world where they feel a little bit safer. It's really something they're more used to. And so um, they're going to suddenly have these face to face tests and they're going to have higher expectations, interacting with people, even things like getting ready, um, wearing something other than pajama pants. It's funny. But on the other hand, they haven't really had to like get ready as much image conscious. We're a very image conscious society. And that dropped quite a bit at least for the school setting. Now the kid's gonna have to learn to be professional again in the classroom situation when he or she's been out of it for a while. Um, and so it's gonna be stressful um, when, we, when we change those criteria. So we have to keep that in mind, that what can we do to sort of help them out, to help them be successful? It's not about just cracking the whip. Um, I find myself doing, oh, kids these days, they can't, kids these days did a remarkable job compared to what my generation would have done. I can't even imagine. I'm a kind of a young Gen X old millennial. They call me Xennial we wouldn't have done so well. Um, students did pretty well compared to what, what you know, us guys would have done. And so this new world we're traveling to is going to have its own challenges for them too. So 
Um, just sort of to bring us back home, uh, keep in mind that the tech should, it should always be there to enhance us, okay, enhance what we're doing. It's not there to replace us. And I know sometimes some people in the education world, I won't cite anybody specifically, uh, but sometimes we work with people who think that a computer can replace us, and it can't, right? A computer can't place, replace a student or a computer can't replace an instructor. Um, but it should enhance, and we have these tools available to us. And so we can, we have this whole world now. So let's take advantage of this opportunity um, and let's go back, having learned something, um, go, go back to where we are to this new world. It's kind of returning to a new place. Um, so hopefully this could be a, an exciting time uh, for our careers. So with that in mind, um, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything like that? I wrapped up a few minutes earlier. I tend to talk really fast, so. There were a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, so I can give those to you real quick. Okay. Yeah, I can see those. Real, uh, this uh, should faculty record sessions and provide to all students. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Um, so what I tend to do is um, uh, what I'll do is I'll just sort of create these general ones. So I don't record the actual class session because I get into all kinds of FERPA issues and stuff like that. So what I'll do is I'll go home, throw on the headset, um, talk to the computer, do a quick presentation, and then just make that available and tell students this is a um, a video. And so I don't know if, if you guys are of a certain age, you already, um, we are, we do this too. And so like, if I get a new device, I get a new phone or uh, a couple years ago, I was, had my new lawnmower and I could not figure out how to change the um, oil on it. So I could have looked up in the owner's manual or I could have just YouTubed it. Um, and so I watched a YouTube video on how to change the oil and boom, there it was. Um, so yeah, the student, they could look up like Diana Hacker's books on how to do like APA and stuff like that, or they'd probably rather watch a quick video on it. And it's going to be more not no offense to Ms. Haggard. Uh, she's she's wonderful. Um, but we're we're a video age now. Um, and so yes, yeah, so record these videos, make them available to everybody. Um, but do make sure you're not violating FERPA. So you don't don't put that out there so that students are uh, being exposed uh, to each other. Um, um, uh, how do you do the create your own path? Um, I'll make that video available. It's a lot like a PowerPoint. It is. I, I use Google Slides. It works in PowerPoint too. Um, so you just um, uh, basically, I'll, I'll, I can show you real quick. Um, so check this out. I, there's uh, the video I have will, um, will make it a little bit easier for you, um, but i um, go into more detail, but just show you how quick and easy it is. So if we go into this one, so let's say I want to, um, whoops, let me close this up. So let's say I want to have this, uh, so when they click on indigenous relations, okay? So I'm gonna uh, find the slide. And so I don't have anything printed up here, um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight this, this word, and to do. And now I'm going to, oops, it's hard because half of my screen's covered up by uh, uh, Zoom stuff. Um, but um, so I, and so I want to link it with, to do, and it keeps bringing down. I don't want to do that. It's easier than it looks, trust me. All right, so click off of this. So I, I will just pretend that this says, so I want to link Puritans, okay? And so, because we can see that, I can see that so without my screen being blocked up. So I just go to um, link, slides in this presentation, and then I can just slide down to whatever I want it to link to. And so let's say I want it to link to slide four, and then I just apply. And then if I click on that, so let's say I'm presenting to show you what exactly it would look like. And um, so I click on that, boom, it takes me to slide four. Um, so, um, so that's all there is to it. And like I said, the video is gonna have a lot more detail, but that, I mean, that, it's that long, that's how long it takes. Um, so yeah, that'll be available to you. Um, uh, do you feel like quality is as good online versus FDF? Uh, it depends. Um, I'm inclined to say I miss face-to-face. -face. I usually taught about three-fourths of my classes, four-fifths of my classes face-to-face, um, -face, and I miss it. But I was already leaking a lot of this stuff in. There's a lot of benefits, a lot of tools. So it's sort of like saying, um, is walking as good as driving a car? Um, it kind of depends. Um, so I want to be able to do both. Um, so if I'm just going across the room, I'm probably not going to get in my car and drive to the kitchen. Um, but if I need to go across town, yeah, I'm going to pick the car over the walking. Um, so yeah, I think that we can do both. Um, so we, we can incor uh, incorporate both of them. Um, there, it just depends on the situation. Um, so it's nice to have resources to both. And I think Zoom can sort of approximate face-to-face, -face, but it's not exactly. It's, it's, if the person has the flu and you still, maybe you're just kind of sick, but you don't want to get everybody else sick, then let, hey, let's Zoom. Um, that's great. Um, that's better to be online. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, we'll see you later, John. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, so I think it, I think we need both. I think there's there's something to be used from both to be learned from both of them. Um, as far as how does it uh, create a, a uh, how does a class session create a FERPA issue? Um, it just depends on how your school is interpreting it. Um, because if a student's image or their voice or their name or what have you is distributed to the public, um, then they could say, hey, look, I didn't give you permission to use it that way. Um, so I just tend to keep um, um, as many uh, students out of it as I can. Now with Zoom right now, what I'm doing is recording classes and I tell the students up front, I'm recording right now. And then if somebody has a question and they say the questions get kind of intense, I'll say, look, I'm gonna pause the recording pause it and then we can have those discussions that way they if somebody's feeling like they don't want to have it recorded we don't they don't want to I want to have them clam up or anything so anyone else perfect thank you uh okay yeah, uh, Kayla can ask a question this live how do I how do I let Kayla ask a question oh yeah, Kay Kayla okay so she she's I didn't I missed it read that so all right looks like everybody's done so um yeah so wonderful Awesome. Well, appreciate all the questions from everyone. Um, yeah, me too. Really quickly then, um, first say thank you to Nick. Really appreciate that. That was extremely interesting and definitely captivated me the whole time. Um, but so I'm also going to put up a quick poll for everyone. So if you can just take a minute and fill that out. It's just three questions. So it should be really quick for you. I'll have that up in just one second. Let's do this. All right, that should be launched now. And yeah, we see some answers coming in. Perfect, I did it correctly. Awesome, <laughs> well, <laughs> always a concern. <laughs> no, but um, so just so everyone knows, the next concurrent session will begin at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can view the chat for uh, session meeting room links or to access the conference website for a complete list of the concurrent sessions in the descriptions. And I'll have those links in there in just a moment. Um, now, while accessing the conference website, please do not forget to swing by the exhibit hall to say hello to the Hawks team. We'll greatly appreciate it. Um, you can view a quick five minute demonstration and be entered to win our hourly giveaway, which is going to be your choice of a smart pen, a standing desk, or a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, which are great potential prizes for five minutes of your time. So um, with that, I'll say a thank you again um, to everyone who attended um, and to Nick, and then we'll see you all at the next session. See you later. Thanks, sir.